In this video, I'm going to show you how to create a simple website building application. So let's get right into it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open my coding terminal, which I'm using Ubuntu on WSL. Now that we've loaded into the terminal, I'm just going to create our app. I'm going to do world's new website builder. And as far as database, I'm just going to use PostgreSQL and I'll use Tailwind for the CSS framework. So just like that, we can press enter and it'll generate our new Rails app. Now that the app is finished installing, you can cd into the directory. Now that we're in here, you can start the server with bin slash dev and then go view the app at localhost colon 3000. You'll see that uh, we don't have a database yet, so I'm just gonna click the button to create the database. And just like that, we've loaded into the Rails screen, which means everything's set up in our Rails app and we're ready to start coding. So for this site, for this uh, app that I'm building, I want there to be user accounts and you're gonna have to sign in first. And then once the user signs into their account, they have the option to create a new store. That might be the first thing that we do is like create them a, or it's not a store, it's like a website. Just be like, create your new website. And you can put in the name that you want. And then after that, you can go and actually see the preview page and you could start adding in different components on the page. I want it to be really easy. So let's start with the users. And to add users to our app, I'm gonna use the device gem. So we can run a bundle add device. I'm also gonna add the Tailwind device gem. And after that, we can do a Rails G device, uh, where's it, we'll install. So that's gonna set up everything that we need for device. The last thing is gonna be just to set the root and then we can also add alerts into the app. So I'm gonna quickly do that by opening the code up in our code editor. And I'm gonna head over to the app views, layouts, and the application file. And I'm actually gonna delete this main div too because it adds this padding, this container, which can kind of interfere with the styling. Now I'm gonna render a new partial at the top. That's gonna be layout slash alerts. And then we can create that underscore alerts file, underscore alerts.html.erb. And then we'll drop the code for the simple alerts, which is just showing the notice and the alert. There's two different states. Like if something went good, it would be a notice. If something went, like there's an error or something, it would show the, uh, the alerts. So now we can do Rails G tailwind underscore device colon views, which is going to install the views using the tailwind device gem. So now we have sign in views, which are styled in tailwind. And the last thing I'm going to do with device is to generate the device model. So to do that, we have to say Rails G divides and then put in the name of the model you want for the account. So for us, we're just going to keep it simple and do user, we'll do Rails G device user, and then press enter. It'll set up everything for our user model, and we can migrate the database. So now that we've done all this, I'm just going to start the server again with bin slash dev, and I want to get things going in our app. So we do, so we still don't have uh, a root page for the app. So I guess let's generate a scaffold for the websites real quick. And then we can set that as the root. So let's do Rails G scaffold website. And then a website is going to have, I guess, like a name. Or I guess, should we do the domain? No, nah, let's do name. So you just put the name of the website. Because at first, I think I want to give them a subdomain. So if you guys know what subdomains is, it would be like if the store was called Indigo, then it could be a dot websitebuilder.com if that's the name of our website so we could offer a subdomain first and then if they wanted to have their own domain that they go and buy and then they connect to our app we could offer that as well so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to go over to config routes again i guess we haven't been here yet and i'm going to go to root and i'm going to change the root and set this to the website's index and now if we reload Oh, we should see. Oh, wait, I didn't even scaffold the, the website yet. So let's finish this. Like We're going to do Rails G scaffold website name and then a user belongs to. Whoops. I didn't mean to press enter there. 
let's do it again. So we have a name and a user colon belongs to. Like that, we have our new website model. Now we could just migrate the database and start the server. And I'll go back to the website. And boom, just like that, we reload. We'll see that we have websites in here. And because I got rid of the main container, everything's kind of like weird with the padding right now, but we can fix that. If we go to Fuse, Websites, New, all I gotta do is just add max width. Oh, and probably margin top. I don't even think that's the right page. I'm on the index. If I did a max width here too. So yeah, this is what the new website looks like. Uh, so what we could do right off the bat is we don't want to have this user field here. That's kind of dumb. So we could just remove that off the page. If we go to websites, form, let's remove that user ID. Of course, we'd also change up this controller because right now we don't even have a user signed in. So what we need to do right away is go over to controllers, websites controller, and let's set it before action authenticate user, which is going to ensure that you're signed in before you can ever access any of these websites pages. So now when we reload, it shows us the sign in page and we can also go create an account. So I'm going to sign up with my new account. And the reason why, the again, the padding is weird is because I got rid of that main container. So let me quickly add a padding for our sign-in pages. So if we go to device sessions new, you can just add a padding top on this top div and then on the new as well. All right, so this looks good. So if I'm going to sign up for my new account, sign up just like that and then we can create a new website and this is what the website's new page looks like now I feel like it might be cool if if you don't have any websites yet we could just automatically redirect them to the new page I feel like that's a pretty cool flow of things so what we can do is let's go into the websites controller and let's edit wherever we're calling the website model let's instead call it off of the user so that we're not doing we're not just getting all of the websites, but we're only getting the ones for this one user who signed in. So we replace just that one website model with current user website. Make sure anywhere, including the set website method. Current user websites. So this also helps with security because now the user can only look at websites that they have created. One thing we have to quickly do is go to the model and go to the user.rb model. We're gonna add in the association as many websites just so that we can connect it to the website model which already has the belongs to inside of it. Now that we got that, we should be set up. Oh, it looks like there was a typo. I accidentally did a singular website. Add the S on there. We can reload and everything's working as we expected now to get that logic to redirect off of the index page this is where we're going right now this is the root we can check if at websites dot size dot zero and we can redirect to new what would it be it would be like new website path to reload and boom we're on the new website path and yeah if you wanted to let's say change this design we can make this better as you know like this isn't usually how I would expect a page to look like if I'm gonna be paying for that service so we can make it look a lot better so if we go to websites new we could totally style this and try to make a better design that we think would look good so for new website, 
create a new website. I also kind of like dark mode too. I should probably start supporting both light mode and dark mode in my apps. And it's pretty easy with Tailwind. We I can do a whole video on that. What I'm thinking is we kind of center this. I might not even have these links. Getting rid of the submit. Because we're gonna totally be styling this, and there won't even be a, like a like an edit page like this. Because we're gonna make it so dynamic with this site. So let's go back to the new page. I'm gonna center this header. Create a new website, and instead of form, or instead of name, or like instead of it saying name right here, we could have it say. What do you want to call your website? We could even try to center this if we went to the class text center for MX Auto. I bet if I go on here and I do flex, flex call item center, I could get it centered. Nice. And then I almost want to get this whole page a little bit more centered. So to do that, we could go flex, flex call, justify center. Okay, is it justify center? I think it's justify center and item center. And we also have to be like height screen so that it knows that there's a lot of space. Now I gotta get rid of this margin. Instead of margin top, I actually do like padding bottom to push the text up a little bit on this side of the screen. I feel like this design's a little bit better. You can still work on it. Like now the text field it has gone pretty small because I did the item center. Which I don't think we actually needed that. We can put it back, but I think I still wanna Customize this so it's not just a huge text field. So I'm gonna go to the form and on this, or even I guess the div, I could add a max width. It doesn't have to be that huge. And we can do MX auto and width full so it takes up the full size of the max width if it's if it can. I think this is all right like this is all right design we might even get rid of the h1 at this point make it smaller create your new create your new website now what do you want to call your website i feel like this is all right but maybe we should have this text i almost feel like we shouldn't have two texts so maybe i'll just hide this hidden and I can make the label bigger on the form. We can always change this type of stuff later. 2XL. What do you want to call your website? <laughs> now we could even style this form a little bit, like this field a little bit. So instead of rounded medium, we could do rounded full. Now we have that rounded look. We might want to get rid of that blue, although I guess it's not too bad. Let's say, what do you want to call your new website? We could even put a placeholder. Whoops, I don't think I did that right. Forgot the ending string. Cool. Yeah, if you're at this point, you're just thinking like, whoa, I'm ready to launch my website right now. So you type in indigo.com. And then obviously there's no button, so I need to quickly add that. I kind of just want to use an icon for submitting. So to do that, we can grab an, a free icon. 
from any website. I think there's one on here. Maybe send paper airplane. We can grab that SVG. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a div around the text field. I'm going to give that a class relative. And I'm going to indent the text fields. I'm going to drop another div with a class absolute. And then right zero. It's actually going to end up being more like right is two and then top maybe 1.5. So we're going to be positioning the SVG over the text field. And we're going to have it on the right side. And then we can give this a width class. So we can do width 8. Let's reload. All right, so now we got the icon to show up on top of the text field. But it's not really right just yet. And also the sizing got a little bit messed up. So I'm going to come back in here and let's change top to two and let's see what else we can do so i think the reason why the text field is no longer the right size is because we added the relative class in the div so i need to just put a width full so it will take up the full size now this is looking a little bit better i'm trying to find the right padding to kind of center the icon if it looks like two wasn't enough we can try top three. Oh, and that looks perfect now what we can also do is we can add padding right on the text field. Now it's not likely that anybody's going to have a domain that's like this long. But I guess when we go mobile, oh, we should actually style this for mobile real quick. So all we need to do is just uh, basically add this medium breakpoint. And then we could do medium for width full two. And then on the phone we could do width two thirds. Yeah, that's not bad. Or maybe even three quarters. Quarters. Thinking, what do I, do I want to have it? I guess three quarters is kind of good for phone. Oh, whoops, not three. Three quarters. So let's say I do have like it's not really likely but as you can see if i do type all the way down here uh, it overlaps the icon so to fix that we can add oh i added margin right that's <laughs> i meant to add padding right because it should have already been fixed now if i press look it actually it just overflows and it scrolls right before the icon so it looks perfect yeah i never realized how easy it was to add like icons on buttons i never knew it uh, when I was starting out developing, but it's really easy. It's just a styling trick. Then we can go to the full screen. This is what it looks like. Yeah, let's create our first website. So probably most people are going to actually add the .com. That's big thing .com. So we'd want to probably parse out the dot part. Oh, also look when you hover on the icon it doesn't show you it doesn't look like it's clickable i think the reason is because it's not it's actually just a div so what i meant to add is i think you could do it inside here so button tag type submit yeah. so a button tag is going to automatically submit the form and with type submit it's even more likely that it's going to work now you see when we hover on it, it actually does the cursor, but we could even add a hover state to the icon if we wanted. Like we could do it so when you hover on, we do group on this. And then hover of text indigo 500. As you can see, when you hover, it turns indigo. That's pretty sweet. Now let's try to launch our first company. So I'm drinking our coffee right now. Let me say like coffee, coffee drinkers co. Or dot co. I'll press send. And boom, just like that, we created the website. So it's that easy. And it's already set up. If we go back, this is what it looks like. We can show the website. 
So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm probably going to parse this out. I'll parse out any domains or anything. So let's go over to the model uh, user.rb, and I'm just going to define a new method. So usually we added, we had the name. So we could have like another name method. You can be parse name where I take the name and I split at the dot and I only return the first part. So anything after the dot, I wouldn't return. Now, the only tricky thing about this is what if the user, you always want to think about the edge cases. So what if the person had included a subdomain? If they just thought that was cool. If it was like app dot my creation dot com or dot AI or something, if they did it like this and I split at the dot, it would only return the subdomain, which wouldn't be right. So we'd have to do instead is do pieces equals this. This is just one way to solve it. So we could check if pieces dot size greater than two then we are going to take pieces and return the first to the la to the the one before the last one <laughs> i think that's right and then we'll join just join again together and we should be good now the other case if it would be either two or less we are just going to take pieces one return it. Now I have no idea if this is going to work. So let's try and go to the show and get this to, to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete everything from the show page because we're going to totally change that. Just like that. The first thing we can add is an H1. And let's just print out the at website dot parts name. To see if it's working correctly let's make sure to close off the ruby if i reload i put it on the wrong one i put it on the user model i actually meant to put it on the website model so now that's set up right if i reload oh it did work correctly sweet all right so what i'm really thinking is what we want to do is this show page for now would just be a full editor. And what I'm really thinking of is like a sidebar pop out where you can kind of choose components that you want to drag over into your site. And as soon as you drag them in, it'll add it to the site and it'll like display the code that was added. Uh, but first I want to add the slug in the URL. So if we can get a slug for the website, then we could put it right here so that we can go to slash website slash the name and that would help us determine which site we're on a little bit better. So there's a few ways you can do this. There is a library called friendly ID. Which I might just use. So friendly ID will help you set the slug and then if if it's not unique, so let's say some other guy has a website already with this like with this key, then it's going to add a random string to the end to make sure that it doesn't affect like the other guy's URL. So that's kind of helpful. That might be a reason to use it, although their CI is failing. Uh, I've used it before in the past. So all we gotta do is add the gem to our gem file. I'm gonna do that real quick. Add the gem friendly ID. And when I quickly stop the server, run bundle. I think there's a couple other commands that I have to run. So the first one is we have to add a slug to the table that we're going to use. So slug, and then you have to set unique. Just make sure to do that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do rest migration. Add slug to websites, and we're going to do slug unique run that and then we can migrate the database i think we can start the server again 
Oh, actually, there was one more command. It's Rails generate friendly ID to generate the friendly ID migration. Quickly run that. So we have a migration, and we also have an initializer. And we can migrate the database. See what it added. It added some friendly ID attributes and also a table. I think the other thing we have to do is we have to add uh, some lines to our website model. I'm going to copy this code here and then go over to the models website RB and just add it to the top. We're going to extend the friendly ID class and then we're going to set friendly ID. Uh, we're going to use an attribute, which we're using name. I wonder, can I use a, a method? I really hope I can use a method because then I could parse it first and then put it in the slug. So let's try to do this. And, oh, right. In the controller, when we're going to be finding the records, we have to use friendly find. Let me go over to controllers, websites controller, down here on the set website method. I'm going to add a dot friendly. And then the last thing we could do is if we already had websites that we want to add the slug to, we can do this find each in the console. So I'm going to run real C and I can do website dot find each and save. And it looks like there wasn't any errors, so it might actually have worked. Let's see. To reload so when I press show this website it did work so we got slash website slash that method so that's perfect it means you don't need to set a field you can just use a method and that's really cool to see so from here I'm gonna go to the show page um, I guess we could say like the, the starter thing might be just the name of this page like the name of the site and for now, so we'll all add a div class with full flex flex call. Although once we start getting adding components, I don't want anything to get messed up. So I guess let's just leave it blank for now. So it looks like this for right now when you're on the websites page. What I'm gonna do real quick is we're gonna have another model called components, which are gonna be all the different UI components that you can easily click to add in. Now, where I was even inspired for this video was because there was this really cool free tailwind component site. And I was just looking at, like, the components, they're not bad. They're pretty good. And the coolest part is that you can combine multiple really easily because they're in these sections already. So if you go to copy the HTML, I think we can view the code. Well, I guess they say it's just a div but when you copy it it actually copies it as a section so what i want to do is i just want to collect a bunch of these components and then turn it into a website builder so we basically we would have our different components here i might want to add categories as you can see we have categories here and that might be helpful yeah, that's what we're going to have to add in real quick. I'm going to generate that model. So let's come in here. Let's do a Rails G model. I might even want to do a scaffold. Rails G scaffold. Uh, Tailwind component. I can just say UI component. It's going to have a name. I want to add categories. But right now, we could just have category be a string. I would say I would kind of like try to keep it consistent or we could actually create a category model and have a select drop down. That's probably a better way to organize it. Let's use scaffold UI component name. Now we're going to have the HTML content, which will be type text. I think that's good. Do Rails uh, DB migrate. Now one thing for now at least, we might want to have only admins be able to create those components. So we're going to add in admin functionality as well. So what I do here is I usually create a model for a role. ResG model role. 
At least this is what I've done in the past, and I give it a name. Just like that. Let's give you migrate. And then I can just quickly um well might as well do the other one real quick. Rails G model user role, which is gonna belong to a role and it's gonna belong to the user. And we'll do Rails DB migrate. And then what we do is we go back in the code real quick. I'm gonna go to model user and then all right has many user roles. Just like that. And then we could add a method def admin question mark. And it would be user roles where uh, role is at is <laughs> role dot admin role. And then we'd want to also define this admin role method. We can go to role dot rb and to add that admin role we could do a, a self, we do class self def admin role. And then this is gonna be on the, on the self. So it's almost like you're calling it without an instance on the higher level. So we're gonna have to say something like where, uh, oh yeah, where name admin. It's as simple as that, dot first. Now let's go into the Rails console, finally, and we're going to create our first role name is going to be admin. Then we're going to take the user, user.last, let's first check are they admin, it says false, do user.last.userroles.create, role, and we role.admin role. That's how we are going to be creating our admins. And it's kind of a pain, but that's on purpose because we can make it more secure. Instead of just having a Boolean attribute on the model, it's like admin true. This is a little bit more abstracted where you have to create a few different models and then tie them together. Cool. So now we have admins. What we can do is inside of the controller. Our new UI components controller, what we'll do is we'll say it before action, authenticate user. Uh, at this point, I guess let's do authenticate user and authorize admin. Authorize admin, we could define an application controller. We could put it in a protected section. So the cool thing about protected sections is different than private, you can access these methods in other controllers that are inheriting. So like every controller in your Rails app inherits from the application controller. So with a protected method, you can access methods that are defined in the inherited controller. So over here, we could access this. Whereas a private method, you wouldn't be able to access it. We're gonna do protected, authorize admin. We're gonna redirect to root path, if not, current user dot admin and we can do we can add a safety operator which just in case uh, I mean yeah we probably don't even need a safety operator or wait this, the, I guess the case is what if a user is not signed in so we don't have current user defined for whatever reason that's why I want a safety operator cool So it looks like now when I go to the root path, it brings me to the websites page. This is pretty chill. Now for this section, or actually, I'm going to go to the UI components. So I should be an admin now. I am an admin. So I can create a new UI component. And let's just keep it simple for now. Let's do our first one, and then we can worry about categories and all that stuff later. So let's get a call to action first. This is what I used for my other video. So I'll just copy the HTML. Drop it in right here. Put the name is going to be call to action. Uh, yeah. Create it just as easy as that. We have our new UI component. Let's grab a call to action. Let's get 
testimonial. Those are pretty important. Let's copy this HTML. Testimonial. Picture cards. We have another UI component. Um, we could do footers. Those are always fun. Although I feel like a footer might almost go into a different section than the UI components. We want to make sure that it always stays like for, I don't know, the different pages. But we can worry about that later. We also have product cards. Could, could be helpful, but I feel like you'd almost want a product collection more. Even comes with the filter. Like, look, that's pretty cool. Right out of the box. So, ooh, I'll definitely take that. Product collection with sorting options. We have a few different components now. I don't really know what else I might want. Maybe like, oh, frequently asked questions. Those are always cool. Although, some of the styling here just isn't like crazy impressive but it's not bad either hmm Ooh, auth forms although that might even be like something different though i was thinking for a website builder we might we could give them auth forms but i don't think we'd let them customize them or we, i guess we'd let them customize them but we wouldn't let them I guess nobody's gonna be writing code anyways, so yeah, we're we're gonna make sure everything's secure. I'm still figuring this out. What else would we want to show? Maybe tables. Yeah, someone might want to have a table of content. Let's grab this one with the border. Now we have a few components and what I want to do is from here, I want to be able to easily drag and drop them in. So that's the next feature. Let's do it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to websites show. All right. And we can have our class for the main content. I think what we'll do, let's just do flex. We'll have two divs inside. Just have like a width or fits or something. Width one fifth. We don't have our side panel for the components. And I think this is going to be height screen fixed. It's always going to be fixed on the side. Cool. And then on the left side is where you'd preview your website. Let's see inside of here. Let's do another div. Actually, uh, let's add text center here. Margin top, and underneath it, we can have the div. This is where we can start uh, printing out those components. Let's do, and for right now, we can just take like UI components, each do. And then kind of make a card. We can put this in a grid, grid call two. like rounded large see we don't have a preview now what i want to do is i want to take snapshots of what the components look like and then save that on a file that we could put as the preview but for right now we can just do like a little box and we can put the title let's see let's see what it looks like 
Oh, uninitialized constant. Yeah, I don't know what the UI component. That is right. UI. Oh, but I added the S. We want to say UI component dot all dot each. There we go. Look, it does show up. What we could do is we see how this is looking right now. It's kind of weird they put so much space between them. Why don't we put a div class equals flex flex call? I guess I could see why they're why the space is because there's only two columns and there's like a lot more space. Do item sensor. And then we could just put the wait. I have to have this inside of the loop, of course. <laughs> And get the UI component on name. All right, cool. Call to action is actually getting somewhere. Add some styling here. Text center. Um. Right, and I'll add a little bit more space. Maybe just gap Y, eight. There we go. And I think when you hover, I want the whole section to kind of light up. Okay, 700. This case kind of like darken almost. You do light up though. We just have a little bit of padding. Oh, I broke the gap Y. Cool. This actually doesn't look too bad. Then when it lights up, you're also going to be able to do cursor pointer. And then drag and drop. So there should be... I think there's even an HTML option like drag to or something. But there's also JavaScript libraries we can use. But I mean, it's pretty easy with the HTML API too. All right, yeah, this looks good. So from here, it's really just like dragging it over and getting that part to click. And then what I'll probably do is for each website, I could have the HTML content, I'll save it in the database. Right now we don't have a field for that, so we can add that real quick. Rails G migration add. Well, actually we might want to have pages too, because I wanted to handle that. But I guess for now we could do add HTML content to websites. HTML content text. We could obviously get rid of this in a second if we want to move to a different setup. Let's do Rails DB migrate in slash dev reload so now we do have that we were like we're getting everything in place we could even set up the routes if we wanted to like probably the route that we're going to be hitting is just the update route and we could have specialized code in there but right now we're just trying to like do this simple code update update with the website params which actually we're still permitting the user id we want to get rid of that yeah, instead of doing this, you can say if website.save. Yeah, all this code seems like a lot. All like the JSON response stuff. So we're going to expect some sort of param. I think it would be website and then HTML content, or actually, this is going to be coming from the JavaScript, so we could put whatever parameter we want to add in here. Why don't we just call it UI component? And what we do is we say website dot 
HTML content is going to plus equal the params UI component. Now I don't know if the HTML is gonna mess up the formatting when we're sending it through a post request through JSON. I really hope it doesn't mess up the formatting because that's kind of important here. But we could always try to fix the formatting if we need to. But we're going to add it to the HTML content then save. So that looks good to me. Now on the show, we're gonna need to set that up. I'm just gonna look up drag and drop HTML because I don't know if we need a whole library for what we're trying to do. Should be easy. As you can see, this is all you gotta do. You gotta add draggable true, and then you can set events for each thing. Let me add draggable true here. And as you can see, it works perfectly. Now you have the element right here on hands. And all we're going to do is drop it right here. Drop it right there. So it should be easy. But I've messed with this before. It is kind of tricky. So on drag start, that's going to have to hit this so we can set some data, data transfer. Let's go ahead and create a stimulus controller for this dragging. I'll call it drag controller. Go bin slash dev. And I'm going to tie it in. Oh, I want to be able to drop it over here. So let's put it on the outside data controller. Let's drag. And then right here, we can add our event on drag start. which drag start okay that's pretty easy so all we do for that is just data action equals drag start and then put that into drag start function now i'll go over to the drag controller i'm going to rename connect to start and then that's what would happen right here we'd set the data transfer So actually an easier way to, to do something like this, instead of just sending, we should probably just send the, the ID, which means in the controller, we would get a UI component ID. And we'd have to actually look that up first. That UI component equals UI component dot find something like this, and then we wouldn't have to worry about sending HTML over JSON. So that actually fixes our our thing right there. Cool. What we're gonna do is we're gonna set the data transfer text. Okay, that's probably fine. And let's do it with the e. Data set, or actually, we should be able to get a param too, but we need the e, so we do e event dot params dot id. Do it as simple as that. So over here to set that param, we have to do data. Honestly, forgot it. Data drag dash id param probably something like this and we do ui component id so it's very very simple inside of here that's just for the start event so the next thing is going to be on drop and on drag over so let's see i don't even know if this works I was thinking about adding a class will you drag, but it doesn't look too bad, just like this. Although I don't like the cursor. Why does it have the the red error cursor? We might want to fix that. But for allow drop, uh, we want to set that. So on drag over, we're going to allow drop. Go ahead and do that. So right here, this one we can do data action 
Also, I didn't even have to drag. I had all the spell drunk. Data action. Wait, what was the method again? Drag over. Drag over. We're going to run. Okay, allow drop. Which all that's doing is just preventing the default. Kind of silly. Event default. I mean, if it works. And drop is the last one that we're going to define. So, in that method, I'm just reading it from right here. It looks like we prevent default. And then we can get the data off the transfer. Say let data equals data transfer get data for the value, which we just called it text. So this would hopefully be the UI component ID. Now I can console log it for now. Got UI component. Let me print out the value. Now to put everything together, let's try to drag one over. And I didn't see a single uh, log, so maybe I should console log here. So dot log. Starting the drag. Do allowing the drop. So we did start the drag. Let's try to print the params ID and see if we got that correctly. Yeah, we did. We got the one and the two. So that's working right. But it looks like the drop part is not working. And I have an idea on why. So I think with four, four fifths, I don't think it's actually taking up the full page. And the way that we can test is by doing dgpink500. As you can see, it's not even viewable. So we have to also add, well, I'm going to add min height screen. That if we need to scroll, we can. That should fix things. So now if we take it, you see, allowing the drop. The only thing is when we did drop it, it didn't do anything. So maybe I had the event wrong. So on drop, which would just be drop. It looks like I never had anything for that. So let's do drop arrow uh, yeah to drag hashtag drop cool we bring it over allow the drop we drop it and the whole thing works perfectly as you can see it just worked so perfectly now we can go back to show get rid of the pink background oh it's gonna work so now it's it's really so simple to tie this all together. What we have to do is make a post request to our update route. So I'm going to add a static values and have a URL value that we can pass in. Just makes this controller a little bit more reusable. Although this UI component ID, I guess it would be more reusable if we just did call it data. Although the param, we're going to need a param name. We can set that param name defaults to data. We could override it, which is what I'm going to do. So right here on this data controller, let's set data drag URL value equals, and we would just pass in the website path for the at website. Cool. And for the data drag dash param name value, you can set that to UI component ID, just like this. Now we're going to need a library for making the post request. So I'm going to use a uh, Rails request.js. To get that, we can do bin slash import map pin at Rails slash request.js. Now we have request.js. This is a really chill library because it's built by the people who made Rails and it takes care of CSRF tokens. So we don't have to worry about grabbing one of those from the head or anything. So now I'm going to import the post method and down in the drop section, what we can do is we can post. Well, let's do if 
if this dot has URL value, then let's say this dot uh, make request, and we'll pass in data. And we can have a make request, which we're going to set as an async method, because we're going to need async for our host. So then we can do const response equals await host this dot URL value. Also, we're going to get the data through here, so that would be nice to have. Uh, oh, and also we're going to pass this body. This is where we'd set the parameter name. So body. And to do this dynamically, it might be better to define the body at the outside. I'll show you what I mean. So we could do okay, const body equals object, and then body this dot param name value equals data. So just like that. And then we pass body here. Now I don't know if const will affect being able to add a value to it. I think it only means that you can't override it. So this should still work. And then honestly, we don't even need the response. We could just leave it at a wait. Because I don't think we're going to be expecting anything back from the server. That's the beauty of Rails, because we're going to be rendering from the server after that point. So now let's put it all together and see what happens if we drag one of these over. Oh, also the icon goes away because it shows it's able to be dropped. And we made the request, but we got no route matches post. Oh wait, it was post, it was supposed to be a uh, put. So let's replace the post method with put. Drag it over. We also got an error because it says undefined method plus for nil. Hmm. You know what I think is happening? I know it's definitely happening. In that uh, controller, the website HTML content is nil. So obviously you can't add a string, which on the right would be a string to a nil. So we need to basically if website.content.nil, or we could add a default empty string. We basically have to set it to empty string. That should help. So right before we do the addition. That's one way we should be able to fix this. So now let's try to drag. I didn't see anything. Let's look in the console. Look, I think it's actually saving. Yep, update websites with the new content. Why do we still get an error though? Too many redirects. Oh, I wonder if I wonder if we this got called multiple times. Hmm. So what we can do is we can set. Uh, let's go into connect method. This dot uh, making request equals false. So we'll have ourselves a thing that we can use to track if we're making the request or not. So at this point, if we do have it, we can say this dot making request equals true. So say if that this dot URL value and not this dot making request. So like the first time it wouldn't have because make request be set false. Then we're gonna make the request. After it's finally done, we can set this to uh, false again, which will allow us to add more components, which could be good or not because it would mean if we are adding one, we can't add another one. But we can worry about that in a second because it should be very fast. Like making that request should take two seconds, and you wouldn't expect people are gonna be like spamming. You guys know what I mean. So at this point, all we have to do now is just print out the HTML. So inside of this div, the width four fifths, if we just display, actually we're gonna use double equal signs to display it as HTML. Say website.html content. And boom, we get the content. And yeah, look, there totally was a bug because we have like so many of these components. I don't know where the button went. Oh wait, I know exactly what's happening. We're gonna have to talk about that. Oh wait, look, another put request happened. Maybe we should also check if data and data 
Because there's just like, look, like right there when I'm clicking for some reason. Oh, wait, I see what's happening. When I drag, it's now when I drag anything, like it's kind of, even though that shouldn't be draggable, this image right here, it's still kind of dragging. Let me inspect. It shouldn't be draggable. So yeah, let me console log about this data. Wait, because it totally did have data for some reason. <laughs> Why would it possibly have that? It's some random value. Okay, so there's a glitch with Tailwind right there. For some reason, it's saying that we have a param, like we have, oh, it's this part, data, right. Okay, I, I see what's happening. We need to console log here on the start. There's no reason why it should be showing this as the param. There's not a single reason. That's so weird. e.params.id that's crazy okay let me just look at the e.params but why would it try to think that that's a param it's a source We got bugs right here. See, this might even be a reason to use a JavaScript library to avoid just confusing bugs. Cause like, what is, what is this? <laughs> Wrong param. JS. But I want to, I want to actually make sure that it's a real issue. I guess, so one way around this is instead of using params, I thought params were fine. We could just do data set dot um, drag ID. Let ID or let data, call it drag data. And there's no way that it would have a drag data method. I guess what happened was stimulus had a glitch because it was thinking there was a wait. No way, it's still showing up. Thought I fixed it, but it's still. Wait, it's console logging at a different point now. Starting with data. Yeah, it's not even running this part now. So I accidentally deleted this whole thing. Received data. That's parts I'm confused about. Received, <laughs> I guess because it was already set. Cannot read it defined. Okay, let's go back and where did I set that? I set it right on here. So down the line a little bit. Let me uh, put this on a new line. So for the drag ID param, instead of that, we're gonna do data dash Drag dash data. It's actually a little bit shorter. Although, still doesn't like that. Data dash drag data? Why doesn't it like it? Let's see, what does the data set have? It says undefined. Come on, seriously? Oh, wait, of course it'd be undefined. It would be off the target that we're going to get the data set. Target data set. My bad. Data set dots 
drag data, it should be fine. Yeah, we have it now. And then if we go the other way around, this has no drag data, but it still somehow receives it, which is just the weirdest thing. Looks like that failed for some reason. And we get like this too many redirects. Oh, right, because I think in the websites, we're doing like all these redirects, actually. So instead, we'd want to just head OK, because we're not actually going to redirect anymore. I almost want to test with a new component, because that one's getting crazy. Let's create a new website. Let's call it rubyonrails.co. Just like that, we have the website. Look, we have the uh, slug. This is working too well. Maybe I don't want a footer. Maybe I want a product collection. If I drag it, but we still got an error in the back end. Unknown format. Oh, interesting. Uh, so I guess let's get rid of the response to format. So we just don't have to like, it's my app. I don't have to worry about doing stuff like that. Just do head okay. Like, and we're actually getting the product collection, but the styling's not right, and I'll show you, I'll tell you guys why it's not working. And I guess I can just tell you it's pretty simple. Uh, Tailwind, you, you can't use dynamic classes in Tailwind because for Tailwind to work, it needs to compile all of your classes. So for something like this, where we're going to have dynamic, or like we're storing this HTML inside of a model, and then we want to be able to like we're just moving it between kind of the back ends and then we're trying to display it on the page the only way to get that to work really i have done it in other apps is there's a few tricks so for development we can store the content locally into like a temporary file and then pass it into the tailwind config as one of the you know folders to check for tailwind classes so that's what i've done in the past that's one way that we can make sure that the code works for every UI component. And then in production, there's a way that you can also just allow all classes. Now that was needed for another product, but I think for us, we could probably just stick with the temporary classes because those don't really take up that much storage. We just have to make sure that we add those in production as well. All right, I just created a new account. And one thing I was thinking about is we should definitely make sure that these names are validated. So if you try to use the same domain, it doesn't allow you. I guess we don't have to do that though, because friendly ID should take care of it. So if I press enter, yeah, just as I expected, if you look in the URL, we now have this kind of like random ID that was appended to the text. And I guess that's fine with me. So if we do take this, Drag it over. I just want to see where I left off. So I think it's working almost. If we reload, we'll see that we have the Tailwind component. Oh, the only thing was the styling isn't set up correctly. So to do that, I'm going to add some code in the UI components controller. And we're going to have, I guess, like a service or a background job that we can do this from. Let me create a Rails G job of store temp tailwind. That's what I'll call the job. So right here on the create action, I could do store temp tailwind job perform later. And I'll pass in the UI component.id. Now we can go over to the jobs folder. Inside of this new job, I'm going to expect a UI component underscore ID. And then we can look up the UI component right here. UI component dot find for the ID. Now that we have the component, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to need to have a temporary folder. So I think I'll just create a temp. I'll create a folder inside of the temp directory. And to do that, we can use file utils so i'm going to require that up at the top file utils 
And then inside of here, we should be able to use file utils, make dirt p. Now I'm going to go temp slash tailwind classes. So that's the folder we're going to create and just make sure that we have that folder. Then we're going to have a temp tailwind file. This is just going to be the path. It would be in. I don't know if I need to have slash. I think it's just. Probably would be slash temp slash tailwind classes. And then. Tailwind class. I'm going to use a random, a random hex. Or I could use UUID to work. And then we could just do dot X. That's the path that we're going to store. And then to write to a file, I'm going to quickly look that up, write to a file in Ruby. It's very, very simple. Just like this file open, we pass in the file path, we use this W option. And then we can pass a block where we can write any text that we want to add. So for us, all we're going to add is a UI component dot HTML content. So if we have this set up, it means we stored the HTML content in the file. And then all we have to do is pass this folder right here to the config tailwind config JS. Just like this dot slash go to temp tailwind classes and I think we just want to get all of let's do this wild card cool now let's see if this works so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the rails console real quick and do a UI component find each is a way that we can loop over each component and then I can run that job so create store temp tailwind job that's what we called it Let's just do perform now so it'll do it in line and we do get an error you're passing an instance of active record base to find whoops so I meant to pass the ID UI the ID and okay that did run no errors. Now we can test by going to temp. Ooh, I don't see the folder created, so I don't think it worked. Let me search temp slash. Yeah, there's no tailwind class system. That's weird. Create file if it doesn't exist. Rails or oh, Ruby. I just want to make sure I'm doing it right. So yeah, I was going to do it like this, which is what we had. Oh, you just make it be. So actually the reason, huh, I'm not sure why it didn't work. Or temp can one job. One now. Let's grab the last UI component. Oh, last. I just want to see what's going on in this component. Oh, there was an error. Oh, it's wait, it's this one. So if I pass ID, it seems to work, but obviously it's not doing what I expected. So I'm gonna quickly add in the pry rails gem. So I can run binding pry and do a little bit of debugging. Run bundle. And inside of here, <clears throat> I'm just not sure what's going wrong. I can do a binding pry at the very end. As long as that runs, everything should be good. Alright, so now I'm in Rails console again. I'm gonna do door temp tailwind job. One later. UI component dot last dot id. Okay, there we go. And then the binding probably did work. So now we're inside here. 
And if I check what the UI component is, we have it. So the weird thing is, it doesn't look like we created the directory. We have to reload. No, it's still not there. Hmm. I'm actually going to open up my other app and see what I'm doing for this on this one controller. I'm actually running possibly in this job. No, in a service. <laughs> I have it really extracted. So yeah, we just do this. And it's only for development too. That's probably a good point because we could have different code. That looks right. Although we did file puts instead of file dot right. But it should be basically the same thing. Ooh, this might be kind of important then. The Rails root join. Now we did this similar setup. Rails root join temp down classes. That's not bad. It's just weird the make their P doesn't seem to be working. So I'm gonna also do Rails root dot join. Let's pass it in temp down classes. Let's just exit out and I'm gonna run it again. Okay, so <laughs> temp tailwind path. Let's take a look at that. Open dot read. So it says it's there. Huh. Oh, it actually worked this time. So I guess the Rails root join was pretty important. So now it does work. So I'm curious if the tailwind styling is gonna be better, if it's gonna be fixed. Let's reload. Mm. Oh, right. I think I need to run it on all of the components. So let's go to Rails C. Let's do UI component. Find each. UI. Store temp. Tailwind job. For now. UI.id. We just ran that uh, code for each. And if we go and look at our tailwind classes, we do have a full folder of all the different components. So I think that should have got that working properly. Now if I reload, already it looks way better. So we got the complete styling with tailwind. And now I'll show you guys how easy all of this stuff can get come together. So if we grab table list, drop that in, reload. Just easily you have a table right here. You have this, you now we can add testimonials, reload. Boom. So all we have to do is fix the reloading part. That's the part that's kind of annoying. Like you have to reload the page to see the updates. So to fix that, let's go back to the show. And why don't we turbo stream from at website. And what we can do is we can broadcast here whenever we get a new change. So what I'll do is I'll add an ID for the HTML content, I'll just call it HTML dash content. Then what we can do is as soon as we generate the content, so wherever that's happening, which it's pretty simple. Actually, you know what's happening is, um, we're doing it in the websites controller on the update action, we're just head okay. We could actually do some turbo streaming here instead of so the difference is when you do a turbo stream from, it's going to have a WebSocket connection where it's going to broadcast. What I was realizing is we might not even have to do that since we're already hitting a controller action in the update. What we can do is we can say website. Well, actually, this would go over. If I do it here, it would go over the WebSockets, which could be a good thing if you have multiple browsers you want to update. 
But if you only want to update the browser that the request came from, you can just render back a turbo stream. And the way that would work is on the drag controller, we're going to ask for a turbo stream response. So on this put down here, we're going to add response kind turbo dash stream. Now it's going to expect a turbo stream response. So instead of heading OK, we could render turbo stream turbo stream dot update and we're going to target the html dash content and then we can pass in the straight html and then see if this if we put this all together will it work what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new website new website i'll just call it coffee or tea.com and i'm going to start dragging stuff in so i'll start with call to action Oh, it did work. The only thing is it's not, what's it called? It's not converting it to actual HTML. It's just showing it as a string, which is actually kind of funny. So I think to fix that, we can call HTML safe on it. And that should do the same thing. So let's see now, let's drag in product collection. Just easily it adds table list, footer. And just like that, you have a full website. Yeah, this is crazy. Honestly, I'm, I'm I can't believe I created this because this is just really cool. Just like that. And the next thing we might do is add a screenshot so we can screenshot what the website looks like and then show a preview on this page instead of just showing like this UI is kind of ugly. We could try to clean it up a little bit by going to like the websites underscore website partial. Let's get rid of the user ID because we already know it's it's my website. And then on the website name, we can just do like text Excel, Coffee Drinkers Co, Coffee or Tea. That's not bad. Or we could get rid of, if we go to the index and we get rid of this show link, we can instead go on the website partial and just turn this whole partial into a link. Like link to website. Do. We reload. Now this whole thing is a link. We probably just want to add some styling on this div. Padding to BG gray 500. All right, rounded large, let's go. And we can do some space. Uh, so let's go back to the index on this div right here. That flex, flex call, gap four. We're gonna have a little bit of space between each of these and let's also add margin top. So it's not like just right next to that text. So there's a little bit of space. Yeah, this already looks a lot better. We can click on the website. Although obviously they both look the same because we're just using the same components. But what would happen from here we could go create new UI components, which actually this user doesn't have admin. Remember from earlier in the video, if we want to give this user admin, we can just create a user role with the role of admin role. Now the user is admin. We go back in the app, go to slash UI components. We can now see this and we can create new UI components. And where I was getting them from was Tailwind CS uh, three components. There's a site called Hyper UI. Shout out to the author of this. I guess I might as well give them a star on GitHub because I enjoy it. A lot of people use it too. Uh, if we wanted to add in more fields here, like let's say one of these progress bars, just simply copy the HTML, drop it in. Progress bar with icons. Create a UI component, and just like that, we have a new one, and that store temp talent job ran in the background. So the styling is gonna be all ready. So as soon as we come back over here, we can create our new website, tracking AI. And if we wanted to grab that progress bar, boom, we can easily drag it in. And it looks pretty cool already. Now there's a lot of the things that I can think of to add in for features. Like you should be able to customize slug the name like all that stuff add padding because obviously there's no padding right now there's so much we can do i think i'm going to end the video here 
because we got a product. This is a product. This is what we're going to build. Thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this. This was a pretty cool app to build. And yeah, let me know if you have any ideas for features, additions. I'll be giving out the source code for free. So you guys can go download that in the description on GitHub. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you again soon.